My guest today is Jerome Smith. Jerome, you grew up in New York, uh, not far from the famous Apollo Theatre. Your dad played saxophone and your mother was a singer in a gospel choir. Yeah. Well, she sang in the gospel choir. She wasn't, I wouldn't say she was a singer, but we lived next door to the deacon of the church. And so we spent a lot of time in church and she uh, was, you know, raised Baptist church. And so she'd make sure we went and, you know, she'd sing and it was, it was good. With that kind of upbringing, I'd say your prospects for a career in music were pretty good. I, well, you know, my dad played and he played and. The Marine Band, he was a Marine, and you know, he played gigs. He was from South Carolina. He used to play around with his friends and stuff. And, and, uh, and so when he started having kids, he was working, you know, a couple of different jobs, just, you know, regular jobs. He'd play. After work, he'd come home, we'd have dinner, and then he'd just go in one of the bedrooms and, and take out his sax and play. And uh, it wasn't anything mandatory that we had to listen to or anything like that, but there was always music in the house, and... Uh, he had a great record collection um, of everything from big band to grand old Opry and, you know, all kinds of music. So I grew up listening to all this stuff. And uh, and then the church thing was just going to happen because we went to church. And which artists were you listening to on the radio at that time? Oh, on the radios. Man, Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder. Yeah, all the soul singers and, you know, the main ingredient and, and uh, persuaders and, uh, yeah, just a, a bunch of singing groups. You toured with former Iquette, Kathy McDonald. Kathy McDonald. At 15. Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to be a bass player since I was seven. And because it was, you know, my dad was a musician, it was pretty easy to... It was no, uh, it was no adversity with playing instruments. So I started playing and was hanging out in recording studios and rehearsal studios, just part-time jobs. And these uh, these guys came in and and didn't have a bass player. I was cleaning up, and the owner of the studio told me that asked me. He said, "You play bass, right?" And I said, "Yeah, I'm a bass player." And he said, "Well, hang around after you finish, and because these guys are coming in, they don't have a bass player, and uh, they want to jam." So. I hung out, and uh, after we finished, the guy, uh, his name Bob Steeler, looked at me and said, listen, we're going to San Francisco in a couple of days. We need a bass player. Um, do you want the gig? And I said, you'll have to ask my mom. And he laughed, and everybody laughed, and I wasn't laughing because I was 15, and they asked me how old I was, and I told him, and... So they came up to Harlem and asked my mom and told her, you know, it was Capitol Records deal. Kathy McDonald had done this album and uh, they needed a bass player. So my mom, being the genius woman that she was, knew that I was going to go either way, regardless of what she said. But uh, she just said, yeah, just make sure you look after him. He's only 15. And, and uh, absolutely, you should go. Classic studio helper gets a gig story. It was, yeah, I guess that's the kind of stuff that happens. How did the tour go? It was great. It was great. We did some recording. We played a few gigs. And How did you meet guys like uh, you know, Eddie Floyd, uh, Rufus Thomas? Yeah. You got to play with the I got to, Persuaders? I got to play with a lot of these guys. I was playing with the Persuaders, and I went to, I went to San Francisco to do Kathy McDonald's gig, and, and all the time growing up in, in Harlem, my brother was in a band. I have four brothers. My brother Ken played sax and played sax in a band called Black Ecstasy. And uh, it was my first gig in music was being the roadie for my brother's band. But uh, when I got that gig and I left and went to San Francisco and did you know what I was doing. And when I came back, Tim, Tim Green, he was the MD for the Persuaders. And when I got back, he got me the gig. He just said, no, you're going to play bass in this band, and that's how that happened. The promoter for those tours really liked the band, so he kept the band on when the Persuaders left to be the backup band for other soul artists that came over. And Rufus Thomas, Eddie Floyd, uh, Irma Thomas, um, there were a, a, a fair few that came through. That Amazing. we were the backup band for. Man, what a bus. So, yeah, we got 
I got to play with those dudes playing all those hits. And it was just, uh, it was a rush. It was a real buzz. Amazing. Uh, what was your deal with Mick Jagger? Mick Jagger. In, I was in New York, and I had a band called Body Bag. And uh, the drummer from Body Bag, uh, his name's Zach Alfred, uh, got a call to do an audition because Mick was auditioning musicians for his uh, Wandering Spirit album. And uh, the guitar player in Body Bag, uh, Frank Finley, had done the Beast of Burden video with Bette Midler. And, and so Frank is like the tall, blonde guitar player. He's the guitar player in my band. So it, it, it kind of eventuated where, you know, Mick went through everybody. Zach got the call to, to do this audition. And, uh, and they asked him if he knew any other bass players. So he called me and said, we're going to go do this audition. And we went and... Do, we went to uh, I went to audition, and Jimmy Ripito was uh, Jimmy Rip was the guitarist. And Jimmy Rip was from Queens. I'd known him for years, and when I, t I hadn't seen him in a long time, and I turned up, and he's like, "Oh man, what are you doing?" So we just got on like you know, real good, and uh, obviously the audition went well because a few weeks later, I guess it was a few weeks later. Um, we went to France to record at uh, Mick Chateau. The funny part is Zach didn't get the gig, but I did. <laughs> you got a gig with Keith Richards and yeah. Expensive Winos. How did that come about? Well, um, there's a friend of mine named Charlie Drayton and, uh, and Steve Jordan. And uh, we you know, were friends from New York. And, and Charlie was a bass player in the expensive winos. Well, they actually switched. Charlie and Steve always trade instruments and they play a bunch of different things. And so Charlie would play bass most of the time. He played drums as well, but he, 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 mostly in that tour, he was the bass player. And Charlie was playing with Divinals. And Charlie had gotten me the gig playing bass with Divinals because Charlie's the drummer. And, uh, and he was slated to do some production for the next album while he was touring you know, with, with Keith and, and uh, the tour kept getting extended. And Charlie was like, I gotta go and do this record and the tour kept getting extended. <laughs> so, at some, so finally it got to the point where Charlie just had to, he had to go and you know, do this thing and there were more dates to do. So uh, when they were, I had met Keith when they were recording and uh, hung out with him and we jammed and, you know, it's just kind of got to know him a bit. And, uh, and between him and Steve, they were like, well, it's, what do you say? Get your own. So I was here touring with the vinyls and I got a call at the end, near the end of the tour and Steve asked me if I wanted to be a whiner. And I said, well, let me think about that for, you know, about eight nanoseconds. So um, obviously, yes, the answer was yes. That's amazing. And wow. went back to New York and, and went into rehearsals with, uh, with the expensive winos. Did you have a working relationship with Keith? I, I, I admire him greatly, and, and he's a really cool guy, fun guy, smart man, um, and a lexicon of rock and roll. I grew up on all that music that, that he loves and that we love. And so we got on really well in, in that respect. Because we sometimes forget that the Rolling Stones started out as a blues band. They were a great blues band. I heard a, a recording. We were in, I think we were in Palm Springs and we're hanging out on a day off and I'm sitting in Keith's room and I'm listening to this, this blues song and it sounded like, it sounded like Muddy Waters or Holland Wolf or somebody. And I asked him, who is this? And he said, oh, it's us. And I said, what do you mean it's us? He said, oh, it's the Stones. And I said, well, well who's singing? Because it didn't sound like Mick. It was Mick. <laughs> and it was amazing. It was just, I was like, wow. I often refer to Keith as the man that death forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when we were touring, he looked like he was 25 years old from the back. But that was that. What prompted you move to Australia? I was playing with the vinyls. I, I, I started playing with the vinyls in 93, I think, and did that for three or four years and toured all over Australia. Um... Fell in love with Australia. It was pretty, pretty simple. Um, you know, after touring around Europe and living in New York and, and 
people spend a lot of time here and really, really enjoyed it. Um, it fostered some great friendships. I guess the defining moment was going back to New York uh, in January after I'd been on Bondi Beach, you know, having a great time, eating ice cream and just having fun. And then back to New York and it's, you know, it's ankle deep snow, everybody's pissed off. Uh, and then I just thought, I don't know why I'm doing this because in two months I'm going to be back in Australia doing the next whatever. So um, so when I came back, I decided to stay. You also hooked up with the likes of Billy Thorpe? Uh, actually, I met Bill, Billy's wife. I met Lynn in Los Angeles, uh, and and uh, we talked about Billy. We talked about music, and Steve Edmonds was playing in the band. And I, when I, when I decided to stay here, uh, Steve Edmonds and I did a bunch of gigs together, and uh, and then Billy was looking for a bass player. So, um, yeah, I kind of got a look in, and uh, and that lasted for years until I moved to Victoria. Uh, let's get on to your songwriting. Uh, there is a real-life narrative uh, in your songs. Mm. Uh, where do you draw your influences from? I don't think I have to draw them. They just influence. They turn up. They, you know, just live in life, and and uh, and especially, you know, you live live life as a uh, a black American. There's a lot of things you see that that a lot of people don't, and uh, I'm just trying to articulate those things and. Put them in the song because that's kind of what inspires me. It's just, it's just life. Um, it's just things you see, things you do. Uh, some are lighthearted, others are not so much. You know, some are uh, pretty serious kind of things. But you know, nobody wants to get preached at. Nobody wants to listen to that. And so, um, you know, poetry and prose and and melody is the thing that uh, I try to put these ideas in and chase them down when they're running around in your head. Yeah. You recorded three songs recently here, which will be online. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the songs is called Down the Line. Down the Line. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Down Seems the like line. a very personal song. Well, it, it, it's personal, but it's it's pretty much about, you know, our, our living situation and the history and the love-hate relationship that, the powers that be have with indigenous people of all, of you know, all over the planet. Um, there's a there's a weird sort of disconnected connection between history and and uh, and now and and so down the line, kind of talks about the evolution that we find ourselves in. We, you know, we celebrate all these ancient cultures and you know these. The, the Egyptians and the Mayans and all these people are brown people and uh, the the th funny thing is that we we love all those things but you know we see what history does and all the the divergent sort of ideas that our leaders uh, kind of in, in imply and uh, impress upon the, the population so down the line kind of talks about how uh, you know, there's a couple of lines in there about the, you know, the love, luster, hate that put us in a state of wonder, uh, and uh, we're staring into flames, and we're still fascinated by fire, and the way that, that people view each other, you know, with the escalating wars and munitions, and, uh, you know, I wonder why we're not all dead, uh, kind of sp sp speaks to that sort of thing. There's a, a real uh, strange love-hate uh, reality. And the fact of the matter is that we all come from the same place. We've all evolved from the, in the same species, and that's all it is. It's exactly. You know, and so down the line kind of talks about, you know, that's, uh, you know, we, we the powers of the past, and we still don't know what we had. And that's really about that. We have had these amazing civilizations, and but we have evolved to almost look at them like they're disconnected from us. That's us. That's all of us. And we're one thing, we are. So that's that's kind of where that, that came from. Is there a Jerome Smith album in the Pipeworks? 
Uh, I like to be part of projects. I like working with other people. I like sharing the, uh, well, mostly sharing the responsibility because I really don't want to be responsible. You're performing with the Heinous Hounds and Covering Addicts? Yeah, the Covering Addicts. Uh, yeah, the Heinous Hounds. We play at the Cherry Bar every second Sunday. Blues band, Matt Dwyer and Steve Lucas, uh, Ash Davies. Uh, um, Chris Wilson was doing it for a long time now. We got David Hogan playing harp and singing. And I caught you guys at the at this year's Blues at the Briars Festival. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You were headliners. We played. You did. That's right. <laughs> so tell us about Grand Hour. Grand Hour is another band that I that's a, a local band that I play with. It's a rock band. A, a, Original classic rock. We won the, uh, was it the Music Oz? Uh, best band. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we won, we got an award. We're right. an award winning rock band. Okay. <laughs> it's all one word Grand Hour. All right, Jerome, let's take it out. I'm going to ask you what's your favorite album? Louis Armstrong's Greatest Hits, Miles Davis, uh, the, the um, tribute to Jack Johnson, it's one of my favorite albums. Silent Family Stone Fresh is one of my favorite albums. Uh, King Crimson Red is one of my favorite albums. Yes Songs is one of my favorite albums. Um, Grand Funk Railroad Live is one of my favorite albums. And Black Sabbath Paranoid. If Jerome Smith was singing in a karaoke bar, what would I be hearing? Ah, oh, it depends on the list, you know? I mean, I've done that a couple of times. And, and I, think, I think, what did I sing? I, th- I sang Moni Moni the last time I ever did that. What's your motto? Well, my motto is have fun. And if you can't have fun, be fun and be had. Jerome Smith, it's been a pleasure. See you, Jackson. Cheers, mate. Oh, get a good laugh out of that. Oh, we- There's always lots of New York here for me. And then, and then I forgot to turn my phone off, didn't I? It's my daughter. Not Keith? Hell no, 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 hold on. This, this is Cara, my daughter. Say hi, Cara. Hi. Hi, Cara. I'm just on camera at the moment. Oh, he's alright. Ah, uh, see, spoken like a true 16-year-old <laughs> daughter. Okay, I was just wondering if it was 2 o'clock and I was just, you know, watching the show, but... I know. Right now, I know you are, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah, you can always imagine that everything's going to run later than I ever imagined. Yeah. All right. I love you. I'll talk to you Bye. soon. Bye. It's great. I love it. I'm going to leave that in. I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alone.